Today we speak with Steve Bistritz, founder of sellexcel.com. Steve has more than 40 years of high-tech sales and sales training experience. He spent 28 years with IBM and was the manager of sales training for a billion dollar division. Steve co-authored the best-selling sales book, Selling to the C-Suite, published by Magro Hill, and remains a lecturer in the field of sales, sales management, and selling to executives. His sales training workshops have been delivered to tens of thousands of salespeople worldwide. Steve holds a doctorate in human resource development from Vanderbilt University. Over to Steve. Steve, welcome to Extraordinary Outcomes and the special segment, Fixing the Five-Person Problem in B2B sales. I'm absolutely delighted to have you here. Thank you, Sivan Jain. Tell us a bit about yourself. I know, you know, people should look you up. They possibly know all about you, but, but still tell a bit about yourself and then we'll jump right in. Okay. Well, from a business background, I spent about 28 years with IBM in a variety of sales, sales management, and sales training management positions. I then went to work for a small sales training company here in Atlanta, Georgia, where I pre presently reside. And I worked for that company for about eight or nine years, and I was vice president of product development for them, coming up with some of the workshops like target account selling, selling to senior executives, and we taught salespeople around the world some of those workshops. And then I decided, well, I could do this myself. So I started my own business in 2002, really focusing on selling to executives and helping salespeople do a better job of creating, maintaining, and really expanding those relationships with senior client executives. So one of the things I did in that process is did some research with CXO level executives, where I asked them about their relationships with professional salespeople. And then I took some of that, um, you know, study that I had done, research that I had done, and put it into the workshops that I developed. That sounds exciting. And I would love to chat with you about your research because that's of great interest to me. Uh, sure. But we have something else to talk about today, which is. Right which is the 5% conversion problem in B2B sales. We get 100 leads and we, right. at best, sell to five. Actually, according to Forrester, it's as low as 1.8, depending upon the industry, or depending upon who you're selling to or what you're selling, to, at the most, 7.88%. That, that's, that's the range. Uh, any, other, any other situation in life, you said 8% is the success or the highest score that we are getting, we would have been called an abysmal failure. Where do you stand right. on this, Steve? Well, I mean, I, I agree with you there. I think uh, one of the things that we did with helping salespeople manage their sales opportunities is have them take a look at the prospects they were dealing with and seeing which one of those prospects they had no chance of winning and discarding those, disengaging from those so they can focus on the better opportunities that they had a, a better chance of winning, a better chance of, of being successful with. And, and, and that's another key area that salespeople need to look at, is how do they manage their sales opportunities? Getting things in the pipeline is really important, but getting the right um, prospects in the pipeline is even more important. And knowing when to walk away from an opportunity that they have no chance of winning. You know, and one of the things we used to talk about when I talked about the uh, target account selling workshop was um, you don't want to get that account from hell that, you know, costs you a lot of your time, effort and energy and yields very little results to you. You'd rather put that prospect on the shoulders of your competitor. And when you can recognize some of those kinds of situations, those are the successful salespeople. And, and the other thing I found out about, and this is when I was dealing at, at IBM in 1967, okay, many, many years ago, like we were talking a few minutes ago, you were three years old <laughs> when I started with IBM. But I always remember there was this one salesperson who sat right near me in the bullpen. 
we didn't have cubicles, we didn't have offices, we had a bullpen, you know, with desks and actually we even had to share a phone when I started work at IBM as a salesperson, okay? And this person knew how to focus on those right opportunities. He had a built-in qualification system and he knew those prospects, he had no chance of winning, he didn't spend any time with those prospects. He focused on those deals that he could close. His close rate was the best in the office, okay? And um, I think I took a lesson from him in terms of you know trying to develop that approach. So before I actually ask you to unpack what this approach is, tell me how did we as a profession land ourselves here? Well, I don't think it's landing. I don't think it, it's not necessarily us, okay? Because when I started selling back in the day, as they say, okay, um, you know, we had to research our client or customer by, by going to the library, getting the annual report from the company, you know, dealing with the company's investor relations office to have them send us by snail mail a copy of the annual report. I think today, you know, a salesperson could, could virtually drive up to a prospect's office and do the research in the car before they walked into that customer's office. Now, I'm not suggesting that's what they should do, but on the other side of the coin, the salesperson, when I was out there selling, was the expert. We knew the products and services, the, the, the customer, the customer executive. They didn't have that level of knowledge. Today's customer executive is researching not only the solution or the product or service, they're researching your competitors' solutions and products. They're, so, they're researching your um, solutions and products. And also, they're doing research on you. They're looking you up on LinkedIn to see who I'm going to be dealing with as a client executive. So they know more about you and your company and your products and services before you show up the, at the door. In my day, when I was out there selling, I was the expert, okay? It's kind of like going to a medical doctor today. A medical doctor today st still has that same level of knowledge, and they have insight that we don't have as lay people, if you will, okay? But we didn't have that access to information that we have now, okay? So that's how things have changed, I think. That's the biggest change that has taken place in selling, in, in my opinion, anyway. So what you have actually hit upon something I would have anyway asked you about, which okay. is which is how we are still selling the way, like you said, when the salesperson right. was the expert. Right. And the prospect or the customer used to actually depend upon the salesperson to bring in knowledge which he didn't have access right. to whether right. it's competitive knowledge or technological knowledge and so on and he was so he was actually welcoming the salesperson into his office exactly. because that that was his education time right from that yeah the buyer this information asymmetry which used to be favoring the sales professional right the, this information asymmetry has now turned 180 degrees in favor of the buyer, as you just so eloquently uh, described. Right. Exactly. And the buyer has changed, but we are selling the same old way. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Not only has the buyer changed, but the buyer is getting involved in the buying process a lot earlier because they can. Okay yesterday's buyer you know they really couldn't get involved in that buying process okay until they understood what solutions were available and for that they had to depend on salespeople. now they they know what solutions are available out there they know in effect which company has some level of competitive advantage and um you know 
when I and when I was out there selling, the other thing that has changed greatly, okay, is the number of competitors today who are in the marketplace. Okay, when I was selling at IBM, this is this is the the truth. Okay, we had five competitors, a total of five competitors. We used to call them the bunch competitors: Burroughs, Univac, NCR. Nobody ever gets to see because that company doesn't exist anymore. Control data, okay, uh, and and Honeywell was the last one, okay. Now some of those companies are still in business, some are not, okay. But you know we had five competitors, right? Today there's thousands of niche competitors that are going after every aspect of the marketplace, okay. So you're you're dealing with lots of different variables in this process, different numbers of competitors, a different buyer who is focused differently, who gets involved in the buying process much earlier. I mean, so many things have have changed. And, and, and as to your point, we're, we're going out there approaching the selling process the same way we did it, um, you know, 50, 60 years ago. OK. So that's where we have to focus, and that's where we have to find out where where can we get a competitive advantage today? What do we have to do differently than our competitor to earn that customer's business? Very, very important because that's where we'll come to next. But before I move out from this topic, do you see that this is in a way a failure of the sales leadership in the organizations? Well, I think it's to some degree, yes, okay? Um, but also, I mean, some of this is not under the sales leadership's control. I mean, you know, the, the, the buyer's access to information, uh, that's not the sales manager's fault, okay? Now, I think what sales you know, the sales executives and sales managers have to do today is to get their salespeople to focus differently, okay? Getting involved earlier in that buying process, okay? Making sure that their salespeople do the research on the client, you know, knowing about the client's industry. I talk about three levels of learning knowing about the client's industry, knowing about the client's company, who are their key competitors, who are their top five or six customers, okay? And then knowing something about the client executive himself or herself. Now, so those are the three levels. Now, in addition to that, I think salespeople have to be proactive in how they market themselves on LinkedIn. And one of the things I'm telling salespeople today is, here's something you can do right away. Take a look at your LinkedIn profile and ask yourself the question, is it something that would be attractive to a client executive? If a client executive read that, would they be interested in talking to you? What's the added value you bring to the organization? Mm -hmm. True. And I'll give you another example there, if I could. When we were doing that research with CXO level executives, where we asked them about their relationships with professional salespeople, I went with one of the MBA students, and we were doing a practice interview on a major company and a major client executive. I'm not going to mention the, the uh, company name, but the executive was the CIO, Chief Information Officer of the company. Okay. So we wanted to know when and why he got involved in the buying process for major decisions. What do salespeople have to do to become perceived as trusted advisors to him? What has to happen in a meeting with salespeople for the executive to feel it was an effective meeting, for example? So those are some of the areas we focused on. We had a number of questions. So we had this questionnaire and I went with the MBA student and she asked all the questions, did a great job. <clears throat> and then I turned to the CIO and I said, now, Jim, 
tell me why an executive at your level would ever want to meet with a professional salesperson. And this was probably about maybe 20 years ago, okay? Very early in, actually before I started my own company. And um, I'll never forget the answer he gave us. He said, I'd like to meet with professional salespeople because often they can offer me solutions that even people in my own company can't come up with. They've seen these problems in other companies, and I want the benefit of their experience and knowledge, okay? Now, what did that do to me right away? That validated me as a professional salesperson. That said to me, hey, I have value, and a customer executive wants that value. They don't care about my rank. They don't care if I'm a salesperson, a sales executive, vice president of sales, sales director, or whatever it is, okay? They want the benefit of my experience and knowledge. And that's, again, like that IBM salesperson that I talked about earlier. And I'll throw out a name. His name was Bradley Buck, okay? Now, Bradley could get a meeting with almost any customer executive in any of the companies he was dealing with because those executives knew the value that Brad brought to their organization. He was the expert, okay? And he not only knew about his products and services, the IBM company's products and services, he knew about their business. They would often call him up and say, Brad, we're thinking of building a new manufacturing plant in the Midwest. Do you think we should do that? You know, they would ask him for you know, information on questions that had nothing to do about IBM's products and services because they knew he understood his business. And one day, I'll never forget this, I said to Brad, I said, now Brad, now I understand, I, I never seen you bring our manager, Jack, to any of your meetings with client executives. And I said, why not? Well, he said, Brad adds no value, okay? All he wants to do is go there, have a glad hand meeting with the client executive, thank them for the business, you know. He said, I do that all the time. They don't need my manager coming <laughs> with me who, who doesn't add any value, okay? So they don't want to see him, all right? <laughs> so, I mean, that, that really shows you, sure. you know, it's not, it's not who you are in terms of rank it's the value you could deliver to the client executive that they're interested in. Absolutely. And that, and that really brings up another point because, you know, we talk about, you know, the importance of creating value propositions for company executives. And they told us that's important. They told us they want to see the value proposition that you offer to them uh, for your solution. And what I tell salespeople is, you really have three elements of a value proposition that you should be focusing on. Number one is your personal value, your experience, your background that you bring to the client organization. Second is the value of your company's products and services and things that are not really just the solution. Other things that your company brings to them other value that you can deliver to them, experts that you may have in certain areas that they don't have, okay? So that's the second element, the value of your uh, company's products and services beyond your company's products and services. And then the last is your solution. But salespeople only focus on your solution and then they get involved in a commoditized situation with their competitor, right? differentiation comes from those other two elements of value. Very well said, because I do a podcast called The Buyer Side Chat, and mm -hmm. I, I speak to buyers in that podcast. Again, trying to unravel what's going on there. And, and you are bang on, you, are, you, you hit the nail on the head, because they say that price is the last thing on our mind, although everybody thinks procurement is there to negotiate the price. Price right. is the last thing on our mind. The first thing right. I want to understand is how can you add value to the next five years of this project? Right. 
so i i totally agree and and i think uh, you you have articulated it very very well so so i have two follow up questions uh, steve how do we solve this this unending rush to quota to targets and thereby filling the pipeline with junk and thereby <laughs> you know ending up with a 2% conversion rate how how do we solve this well i mean filling your pipeline with junk is not going to get you to quota yeah okay so so the salesperson the quicker the salesperson understands how to filter out those opportunities that have really no value to them in effect right okay um so it's it's doing that qualification process more effectively and um i actually have sales people focus on nine criteria that are part of a qualification process okay uh and i say to them that you should be looking at your um opportunities with what i call three compelling questions at multiple times in a sales campaign the first question is should we pursuing this opportunity what's changing in the client environment that's creating the need for your solution okay so what's changing in the client environment that's creating the need for your solution because what you want to do is align your solution with a key business initiative of the client in other words something the client has to implement something they have to do okay So that's compelling question number 1. What's changing in the client environment, okay? The second compelling question is, do we have a solution that can be integrated into the client environment and have we articulated the business value of that solution to the executive, right? So can our solution be integrated into their environment and can we articulate the specific business value with a value proposition? as i described earlier but the third question is the most important question can we win this opportunity are we aligned with the most powerful people in the client organization who can help us win the deal and i say that person is the relevant executive for the sales opportunity and the relevant executive is the executive who stands to gain the most or lose the most as a result of the outcome of your pro- of the project or application that's associated with your sales opportunity so what i say to sales people is you have to sit on the other side of the desk and view your sales opportunity from the client's perspective okay right? how is this solution going to impact that project or application that that relevant executive is interested in whose neck is on the line for the success of that project or application and when you find that relevant executive that relevant executive can in give can can assert their influence okay over the buying decision and even if a formal decision has already been made the relevant executive can change it because their neck is on the line you know they're going to win or lose from the success of that application or project right so you've got to find out who that person is and then you've got to align with that individual and have them become your mentor and what i mean by mentor is someone who will sell in your absence who when you're not at the client organization they're going to raise their hand and they're going to say steve's solution is the best solution for me. Okay, they're not a champion or a coach cheering you on on the sidelines, okay? Um they're there when you're not there selling in your absence. And when you get to that point, and I can think about, you know, a number of mentors I've had in my past life, if you will, okay, who who have sold in my absence often quietly doing it i didn't even know it was happening sometimes okay 
and, and I'd walk in the, in the office and there'd be a, an order for me. And I'd call the guy up and say, you know, how did this happen? He said, well, Steve, he said, you know, we saw your solution. You described it to us. You told us what it was going to do. You gave us the benefits. You talked about how you would help us implement that solution. And, you know, we we started, you know, they, they started to build trust and credibility in me. OK, and when I become that trusted advisor of the executive, the relationship becomes collaborative. They look for ways to help you. All right. And that not only may be having internal sales take place, but also referring you to other friends of theirs. OK, and other companies. OK, I've had that happen many, many times. So, I mean, it's you know, it's. And it's always going after and making sure that you're doing the best for them, that you're always keeping them top of mind and in front of whatever situation you're involved in. You don't care about the outcome of the transaction. You're more focused on what's going to be the long term benefits of the relationship with that person. OK, and when they see that you're doing that for them, that's when you become their trusted advisor. So I have two quick questions to wrap this up. One is, how do you find this person? That's, right. that's question one. That's question, a great question. OK, go ahead. Question two. I would like to believe that whatever I'm trying to do, my competitor is trying to do the same. They're also trying to land the same guy as their own mentor. Right. And how do I right. how do I sort of manage and ensure that that he's actually working with me. So two, two questions for you. Great, great, great point. Both great points. OK, well, you start off by saying, you know, who initiated the project or application within the company? Find out who initiated the application. All right. And then you have to start talking to anybody who you're working with in the client organization. All right. You have to be always observing what's happening in that organization. Now we're talking about maybe larger companies where we're going to have, you know, multiple opportunities for deals, sometimes long term deals, complex solutions, things of that nature. We're not looking necessarily at a single transaction that's going to happen once and never happen again. We're not talking about that kind of a situation. OK, so. We're, we're always observing. We're always talking to the key the, the people who uh, we build relationships with over time, and we see and observe what's happening in the organization. And then you start triangulating some of this information, and you uh, start to understand, you know, who's connected to who, who's focused on delivering value within the client organization. Um, uh, what kind of value has this particular executive delivered to the organization before? And is this someone who really sets the goals and objectives for the organization? Are they a respected leader within the organization? So you're looking, always looking for those kinds of people. And, and the common threads start to come together and you, you start to see who that person is. And you're right. I mean, your competitors probably trying to do the same kind of thing. You've got to do it better. Right. And then as you're trying to build this trust and credibility or become a credible, um, you know, trusted advisor to the executive, they're looking at you in terms of are you capable of doing this and are you somebody I can trust? OK, do you have a level of integrity? Right. And you build those two over time. And when you build the both of those together, capability and integrity or trust, right, you then become perceived as credible and build credibility with that executive. And, and they start to trust you and they'll give you information. Sometimes they'll give you inside information. Um, but when you see them doing something for you, when that relationships become collaborative, you know that you're their trusted advisor. 
and you know that they're your internal mentor. Um, so I, I don't know if I answered your question, you but did. hopefully I did. Yeah, but you you've did. got to find out. You've got to, I mean, you're right. I mean, competitors are going to try to do that. Um, now, does everybody, is everybody focused on identifying that relevant executive? I don't know if they are. Okay, I don't think you should assume that they are, uh, but you have to be focused on that. And then you have to be asking yourself those three compelling questions that I talked about before. And again, you ask them at multiple times in a sales campaign. And, you know, hopefully the answers to some of those kinds of underlying criteria within those three compelling questions. Um, I've got three other criteria within each of those three. So I have nine criteria I asked salespeople to look at. Not all of them are as important as the others. There are three of the most important ones, okay? Um, and yes, the three most important is, what's that compelling event? Why do they have to do this? The second thing is, have you articulated your specific business value? Third, are you aligned with the relevant executive? Then underneath those three compelling questions, there are nine criteria. And the criteria I say salespeople should be checking is number one, is your solution aligned with a key client business initiative? So that's criteria number one. Criteria number two is what's the client's ability to fund the project? Do they have money? Do they have budget? Do they have access to discretionary funds? The third, What's the client's driving reason to change? Some people call it the compelling event. Why do they have to do this? All right. And again, if your solution doesn't, you know, if you can't answer yes to those three questions, that's number one. That's a that's a red flag. <laughs> OK. <Right. laughs> OK. So number four is what's the viability of our solution? Now we're talking about can we compete? Number five is, do we have the sales and implementation resources necessary to um, win this deal? If we win it, can we implement it, all right? I was talking to somebody at Microsoft yesterday about just that situation. And when I asked him that question, his eyes lit up and he said, well, I think we do, you know, but maybe you can get a business partner to help you. So that's another thing that you can look at for criteria number five. Criteria number six is what's the specific business value of our solution, all right? And have we articulated that? You know, that's our value proposition. So number seven then is what's our ability to affect either the formal or informal buying process? Can we affect it, okay? Uh, or can the customer even affect it, the customer executive, right? Number eight, what's our alignment in terms of executive credibility and support? Do we have a level of executive credibility and support within this client organization? And number nine is what's our alignment with the relevant executive? Are we aligned with the relevant executive? Have we identified that relevant executive? So there's the three compelling questions, you know, should we pursue? Can we compete? Can we win? And then there's these nine criteria. And um, I say to salespeople, you need to be asking yourself and looking at those nine criteria. Those are simple criteria, okay? But keep those three compelling questions in mind. And what I tell salespeople is, you have to internalize those three compelling questions. And it's like, you know, it's, <laughs> it's like that continually going over in your mind. And, you know, the more you can focus on that single direction, okay, the, then you start to figure out which situations should you disengage from. Uh, and those may be situations that are already earmarked for your competitor. You have no chance of winning. And if you won, like I said before, they could become the account from hell that you don't want, okay? And you'll be sorry if you close that deal. <laughs> yeah. And I've had situations like that, you know, where, mm. uh, oh, golly, I wish I, 
I wish we never won this thing. It's <laughs> taking too much of my time, you know, and it yeah. is, you know. Yeah. So that's the kind of thing you have to look at. Um, and the more that you focus on that and identify those key clients and those executives in the client organization, the people who have influence and power, they're going to be beyond that relevant executive. There are other people in the client organization that could be impacting the decision. There could be an evaluation committee. There could be all sorts of things happening. But there's that one relevant executive who, if you get to know that person, um, your life is going to be a lot easier uh, for a long time. Okay. And Wonderful. you never forget those people, those people who become the relevant executive, who you become their trusted advisor to, that relationship becomes collaborative. They're always doing things for you. Um, wow. When you get to that point, you, you know you're you've arrived. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Great. Thanks, Steve, for, uh, for, uh, for sharing this. Uh, as I said, I'm quite certain that we need to talk again. And we, I'll, find, I'll find ways and means to reach out to you and, and, and drawing you into this morning uh, chats. <laughs> uh, your time permitting, of course. Yeah. You have a wonderful day. Thank you very much.